I actually have an, uh, had an addition to my sermon that I couldn't edit fast enough when I was reading. I said uh, I would have to retype the whole thing, so I don't want to do that. And like I mentioned last week, I will be uh, sending out the notes for the sermon, so if you feel overwhelmed in trying to keep pace with it, don't feel you have to. Um, all of us know the importance of light. What will we do without light? We take it for granted. I think, you know, all the years that I've lived here, I've always taken for granted that there's light. I remember when, when Sandy occurred, uh, all of us realized, oh my goodness, no electricity, no power. <laughs> it's like, no TV, no radio, no nothing, but light. How desperate light is needed. You know, if we don't have light, we easily can stumble in the dark. How difficult it is to walk in the dark. Or have you ever been in a place where you have a flashlight? And all of a sudden, that flashlight begins to give way. <laughs> You're like, oh no, I need this flashlight to keep working. Light is so important. Light, of course, shows us the way. And that's one of the biblical images of light. That light shows us, guides us, you know, lights the way. The Word of God lights our path. God is light. Also, light in the Bible talks about understanding, of being enlightened. We, talk about that. we still talk about that way, you know. We talk about seeing the light. Or if someone is ignorant, we say that they're still in the dark about certain things. Light is also in the Bible considered uh, an issue of morality. God is light. Doesn't mean that he's a light bulb or he's a sun. It means that he is moral and there is no moral impurity in him. He is perfect, spotless. So these are the ways that are used. And last, last week we saw the importance of the Logos, the word that became flesh. And this word uh, was God. This word was with God. This, this word is eternal. And now we see, let's look at another aspect of this Logos and that is that he is the light. Look at verse 4. It says, In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. In verse 9, The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. Just like we've seen the connections with Genesis, here's another connection with Genesis. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the next thing we read is that the, the earth was void, there was chaos, you know, in the Hebrew, tohu and bohu, complete chaos, complete darkness. And then God said, let there be light. And there was light. And that was the light of the first creation. And a physical light. The light here is talking about the second light. The light, the light of the new creation. And it's a spiritual light that comes into the world. You know, one of the questions that we always ask as Christians, somewhere in our early Christianity or soon thereafter, we, we ask the question, how did people get saved before Jesus? How did they come to God before Jesus? If Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but through Him, how can anyone be saved prior to that? And we find out is that the light has always been in the world. And people were saved before Jesus the way they're saved after Jesus. By faith. By faith in the light that they have received. The light has gone for. Remember Abraham, we were talking about Abraham in Romans 4. So Abraham believed God, had faith in God, and it was accounted to him as righteousness. But it was not simply him. All pagans had the light of nation. Oh, pagans, is that a proper political term? I don't want the politically correct police coming after me. Non-believers, that would include us too, so we were considered pagans. Non-believers still had the light of nature. This is how Abraham understood certain things about God until God spoke directly to him. But we hear that many abandoned that light, many did not follow light, but there were those who did pay attention to the light that was in the world. Christ has always been speaking. The difference between before and after is that when he comes in the flesh, it is pure clarity. Before you can say, well, the light is like the sun, is like a light bulb, now it's the actual light walking among us and talking. A more direct, personal relationship with God, a revelation of God that surpasses all others. But before the light came into the world, he was shining his light on all human beings. Every single human being that was convicted of their sins, realized they was wrong, even if they didn't know about the Israelite religion, even if they didn't have any contact with that, the fact that they knew something was wrong and they had to do something about it, that was the light of God. Shining in their conscience and convicting them of what they have done wrong. It's the same thing that still happens in places where the gospel has not, been, has not gone out. 
Every time you go to these places and you hear these testimony about people said, oh, I had a vision. I had a dream. God was God came and spoke to me and told me a man was going to come with a black book and he would explain the way to me. These you hear testimony after testimony about the power of God's way. And in the Old Testament, there are people like that. There are actually people who are pagans, non-believers who have the light. And I bet you've read the Bible many times. And maybe you never even paid attention to them and just skipped over them. And so I actually wanted to give you three examples. But after I wrote one example, I realized, wow, I went too far, took too, too long. But if you want more examples, I'll give them to you. I'll give you one that you, I bet you read a million times and never thought about him as a non-believer, as someone who's not an Israelite, someone who's not, doesn't have the, that direct light of the Torah of the temple. And that's Job. Do you realize Job is not an Israelite? Do you realize Job is one of the most if not the most ancient book in the Old Testament. It's a story about a man who has a relationship with God even before there is the law, even before there is the temple. In verse 1 of, of the book of Job, it says, In the land of Uz, there lived a man whose name was Job. This man was blameless and upright. He feared God and shunned evil. He's not an Israelite. When they talk about the geography of where this man was from, he's either from the Syrian desert and, or he was with a, from Aram or from Edom, but he was not an Israelite. When you read the whole book of Job, you'll never see a reference to the law, to the Mosaic law. You'll never see a reference to a temple. It's all a very personal type religion before God reveals himself more directly. And yet we're told that this man, Job, despite the fact that he only has the light of nature, is blameless. And the Hebrew word there means that he has integrity. That when he relates to other people, when people look at him, his neighbors can say, that is a good man. He's an honest man. He's decent. We still use that kind of language today. We might know someone who's not a Christian, but we still say, no, that's a good person. And that's what we mean. That based upon the standards of society, they are good. They're not evil. They're not harmful. They're working to be productive and be helpful. So he has that integrity with his neighbors. But he's also called upright. And here, as John Walton points out in his commentary, the term is commonly used to describe people who behave according to God's expectations. He is able to obey God to the best of his ability. By the light that he has, he is faithful, he is upright. He is following the things of God. Now we know that he doesn't have a personal relationship with God as Moses did because of the way that God is referred to. It says that he feared God, Elohim, not Yahweh, Elohim, which is a generic name for God. In the beginning, Elohim created the heavens and the earth. Elohim was a way that most people refer to God in a generic sense. He understood that there was a God. He understood that this God was powerful. He understood that he had certain moral obligations to this God. And so he followed in that path and he did it. He feared the Lord, even though he doesn't know him by name. Not yet. He will come to know him at the end. And when God speaks to him at the end, he'll say, And Yahweh came and spoke to Job. The personal name of God. This is the first time that... Job has this interaction with God. Before then, it's just basically rituals, following the best that he can under the circumstances. This is why we read in Job chapter 1, verses 4 and 5, it says, His sons, Job's sons, used to hold feasts in their homes on their birthdays, and they would invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them. When a period of feasting had run its course, Job would make arrangements for them to be purified. Early in the morning, he would sacrifice a burnt offering for each of them, thinking, perhaps my children have sinned and cursed Elohim in their hearts. This was Job's regular custom. He knows that God is holy, even though he doesn't know him by name yet. He knows that God has to be honored a certain way. And so he's afraid, maybe my sons did something immoral. Maybe my daughters did something immoral. Maybe they displeased Elohim. I must make sure that I do proper sacrifices. Here's a man before Christ who lives according to light that God has given him. And God says that he is upright. 
because he is responding properly to that light. So you might ask, well, wait a minute, if people can, and this is where I realized when I was writing my sermon, when I was practicing this part, I realized, oh my goodness, wait a minute, there's a question unanswered here. So if people could be saved by the light of nature, why did Jesus have to come? Why did he have to die for our sins? Because they're not saved by the light of nature. You look at the book of Romans, and we did not deal with this verse last time we were studying through Romans. But Romans chapter 3, verses 25 and 26, it says, God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his justice because in his forbearance, he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his justice at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. God overlooked all those sins that were being committed because he knew that Christ would come and offer the perfect sacrifice for all sins. Christ is the sacrifice for sins of those born before him and those born after him. This is the perfect sacrifice. Every sacrifice that occurs in the Old Testament, any burnt offering, any lamb, any, it's only symbolic of the sacrifice that is to come. No lamb, no bull can take away human sin. Only a human can pray for human sins. It was all symbolic. And Paul says, but when Christ came, he is the perfect sacrifice. He is the atonement for all sins. So God in his kindness, forbearance, overlooks the sins that are being committed, knowing the day is coming when the perfect sacrifice comes. So now when that question is asked of you, how are people saved before? By faith. By the sacrifice of Christ. Not only does it move forward, it moves backwards as well. Great theological theme in the book of Romans chapter 3 and 4. So this Logos is the light. And it's illuminating all of humanity, guiding them to the truth. But it's not an abstract thought. As I said last week, it's not a philosophy. It's a person. The light is a person. And that's what, Paul, that's what G, uh, John gets into in verse 14. The word, the Logos, became flesh and made his dwelling among, among us. We have seen his glory. The glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father full of grace and truth. The climax of the first creation... Is humans. Don't you feel good now? We are the climax of the first creation. What's the, what's the pinnacle of the first creation? Us. Created in the image of God. What is the pinnacle of the second creation? Jesus Christ. The one, the perfect human being who comes to undo what Adam did. What Adam did, what humanity did by sinning and engulfing the world in sin and evil. This one, the new Adam, the second Adam, has come to undo this work. But this incredible language that occurs here, it tells us that he came to dwell among us. But that word is so rich in meaning. It means literally to pitch his tent. Or I think the King James says, I have, I have uh, Julio back there. The King James says, tabernacled among us. And I think tabernacle is a beautiful word because that's what it refers to. This word was the word that was used about the tabernacle about the temple, when the presence, holiness of God will come to dwell there. As N.T. Wright tells us, that's the theme of this gospel. If you want to know the true God, who the true God is, look long and hard at Jesus. You want to know God, you want to know what God the Father looks like, you want to know what He is like, look at Jesus. He is the perfect presence of God. God coming to abide with us. Now, of course, the, one of the great themes in the book of John is, wait a minute, if Jesus is the temple, the true temple, where the true presence of God is, then what about the physical temple in Jerusalem? Is it obsolete? And John says, yes. Absolutely. It is so obsolete that it's going to be destroyed because the real temple is among us. Now, the glory of glories, if we go even further theologically, is that Jesus, who is the temple of God, and gives birth to us through the Holy Spirit, makes us the temple of God, where the Holy Spirit dwells. Where is the temple of God to be found today? Not in Jerusalem. It's right here. 
Every single one of you who is a Christian is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And together, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. When we leave this building, the temple leaves. This is just a building. We are the people of God. We are where the presence of God abides. And this is the great thing that Christ has come to do. But he is the first. And he is, as the Bible says, the one and only son, the only begotten, the uniquely born one. There, he's only one of a kind. There is no other like him. Even us, when we come to faith, we come to faith by adoption. We are not naturally born children of God. When we came into this world, we chose to rebel against God. We chose to sin. We chose to get, go against God. Once we are redeemed by the blood of Christ, he adopts us into his family. And we are made sons and daughters because of Jesus Christ. But he is the natural child of God. The uniquely one, the unique one who comes. The light has come into the world. So you imagine, with this light coming into the world, what should be the reaction of people? You would think, oh my goodness, the light has come. Everyone should worship the light. But what we find is that no, there's always been a war between light and darkness. Because men love darkness rather than light. There are people who reject the light. But this war has always been going on. Look at verse 5. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. Again, back in Genesis. The darkness trying to fight against the light, but the light prevails over it. But it doesn't understand. The word overcome, literally in Greek, can mean either understand, comprehend, or overcome, extinguish. The darkness does not comprehend the light. We think that we have a problem comprehending darkness. We look at bad people and we say, why are they bad? Why are they evil? Well, trust me, the Bible says they're looking at you going, what? Why are you good? Why be good? You know, at at best, what people are doing today in many ways is being very Machiavellian. They act out the part. They behave like they're good. They go through the motions. They, they go through routine. You know, they come to church. They know how to dress well. They know how to sit well. They know how to sing well. They know how to pretend. And then when they go on their regular lives, you hear them. You hear who they really are, what they really are. They're able to hide it. Darkness does not comprehend the light. On the contrary, it tries to extinguish the light. When Christ came into the world, they want to eliminate it. Eliminate him. Eliminate the light. There's always been an opposition, but the light has always been there shining, calling out. And we read in verses 9 to 11, The true light that gives light to everyone was coming to the world. He was in the world, and and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, and his own did not receive him. And here all people are condemned. Actually, John does here what Paul does in Romans 1 through 3. He goes to show that the light has come into the world. And rather than receiving the light, most people rejected that light. Those who who, comes to the world, he's the creator. They did not recognize him. Now that recognize doesn't mean like, oh wow, they didn't have like a good picture of him. Oh, that's what the creator looks like. Oh, there he is. Let's worship him. No, recognize means rejection. When you recognize Christ as that you acknowledge who he is, And you give him the proper worship that he deserves because you know who he is. When you don't recognize him, that you know who he is, but you don't care and you don't want to give him the worship he deserves because you want to be God. You want to rule your life. You don't want him. You want your darkness. You know, one of the the philosophers that has fascinated me has been Thomas Nagel, who, to me, I keep praying for him. I believe that one day he will come to know the Lord because he's an atheist. And one of, the things that, one of the things that he writes, he talks about how he's, got, he's getting scared because many of his intellectual friends around him are becoming Christian. And he doesn't like that. And he admits, he's so honest, he says, I don't want there to be a God. Why? So I can do what I want. That is so honest. I love that. I read that, I'm like, wow, I'm an honest atheist. That's true, that makes sense. I want to live immorally. I want to do all these things. I don't want to think about the th- I don't want to think about it. Well, if I go with my neighbor's wife, that's a sin. I don't want to think that. I want to be able to do whatever I please. I want to lie and get away with it and say how oh, there's nothing wrong with it. But he admits, 
This is why I don't want God to exist. So it isn't an intellectual problem. It isn't that, oh my goodness, they couldn't, uh, they couldn't realize the picture and say, oh my goodness, this, this is the creator. It's a heart problem. It's a rejection of the inner being saying, I don't want this person. I don't want the light. The light comes. I rejected the light when it was in nature. I don't, I'm certainly going to reject him when he's in the flesh. I don't want the light. They reject him. Even the Jewish people, he came to his own. The very people that God called out, he calls out Abraham, he creates a nation so that they can bring the gospel, so they can bring the good news to guide the people. And even they reject him. Creation rejects him. The Jewish people reject him. But not all reject him. Not all Gentiles rejected Jesus. Not all Jews rejected Jesus. Verses 12 and 13. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or father's will, husband's will, but born of God. There are always those who accept the light. Before Christ came, there were those who reject the light and those who accept the light. Same thing after he arrives. Only now is much more powerful. Because before you could have said, oh my goodness, I really can't tell by nature, I really can't tell by this. But now the light is walking among us. God has come in the flesh. It doesn't leave room for neutrality. It's easy to be neutral when we're not sure about the truth. When we can be very gray about something, ah, we're not really sure, so maybe you're right, maybe I'm right. But when the light comes and walks among us and speaks and tells us this is what God is like and this is what you need to do. And then he demonstrates by his power, not only of miracles, but but rising from the dead, that he is indeed the son of God. Now neutrality becomes difficult. Now you have to decide, is this the son of God? Is this the Logos? Is this the light? Or do you reject him and say, even if I know that he's the light, I don't want to know him. I don't want to search him out. And how many people don't search out the light? We live in a generation where there is so much knowledge. I'm just amazed. I'm amazed. All the data that we have, anyone can research anything. And yet people refuse to believe in God. They refuse to listen to Christ. And yet it's Google, Google. (laughs) I'm sure you'll find many, many idiotic sites, but you'll find some good sites as well. And it's a question of searching out. And asking the questions and seeking out. And the Bible says that if we seek him, we will find him. If you are truly seeking to know the Lord, you will find him. But the birth that comes to us, again, is still the miracle of God. We are born again. We are born of the Spirit. Not because we're born into a certain family. It's not because I was born Jewish or because my mother and my father were Christian, they raised me Christian. It wasn't because I was born in a Christian nation. First of all, there's no such thing as a Christian nation. Uh, Christians are individuals. We are Christians. A nation cannot be Christian. Uh, they, a nation cannot convert. No more than a puppy can be Christian. Sorry. You know? Human beings can be Christians, and we can reject it. But you are born again because of the grace of God coming to us and us accepting Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And that's the wonder of it. Again, I brought you to this passage because it's beautiful. This passage is incredible. And I've only, I've only scratched the surface of the beauty and majesty of this passage. And the beauty and majesty of Christ. Our Lord is a glorious Lord. It wasn't simply a man born 2,000 years ago. It's God. God coming to dwell with us. Amazing. And to die for us, for our sins, so that we might be saved. The perfect sacrifice. That is the glory. Every time we read about Jesus, never to think for a moment, this is an ordinary man. No, this is the word of God made flesh. The light who's always existed now taking on human form. Glory to his name. Let us pray. Father, we thank you 
for the beauty of your word, for the beauty of your truth. We thank you for Jesus Christ, your son, who's come into the world, light coming into the world, to dispel our darkness and to allow us to be baptized by your Holy Spirit and to come into your family. We thank you and we praise you in his name. Amen.